Well, tonight, uh, I thought I would take off a little bit on what we did last Wednesday night when we were teaching on uh, the tabernacle of the wilderness and its stay, particularly at Shiloh. And uh, so I'm taking that and I'm launching into a little different discussion on the Feast of Tabernacles, which we have just concluded, Sukkot, here just uh, a few days ago. And I want to focus in on the Pool of Siloam, and then that will lead me to the Water Gate. No relation to Washington, D.C., but to an ancient gate in Jerusalem. And from there, I'm going to go to uh, the gates of Jerusalem and the walls of Jerusalem. And so that's my uh, trajectory uh, that I'm going to tonight. So I'd like to uh, talk about the Feast of Tabernacles to start with and how Jesus used that occasion, the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, to talk about himself. God originally, in the observance of the Feast of Tabernacles, said that the people should remember what he had done for them. And so he had them to live in these little uh, booths made out of branches. He said, all native-born Israelites are to live in booths, so your descendants will know that I had the Israelites live in booths when I brought them out of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. And so it was a way of looking back to the time in the wilderness when God was leading them out. And what God did, he had this encampment, or the tabernacle was virtually the center of everything that happened uh, in the wilderness. All of the various tribes settled in, uh, in a particular configuration. When they traveled, uh, Judah led the way, and the various tribes were all organized on a particular pattern, which I think you can even recognize the pattern that's there. Uh, they camped in a certain sequence, if you will, around the ancient um, tabernacle and all that related to it. So uh, God wanted them to remember in the Feast of Tabernacles what he had done for them there in the wilderness. He gave them uh, fresh manna every day except on the Sabbath. The day before the Sabbath, they were to you know, collect up double duty and it would be preserved until uh, the following day. But that was the way they were supposed to do it. Uh, he wanted them to remember that he had taken care of them in the wilderness. And so they were to live in these little booths at harvest time. So about this time of the year when all the harvest is in, pretty much all my garden harvest is in now, three or 400 pounds of potatoes and and I got cabbage to harvest still and some carrots and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, it's harvest time and we're gearing up for Thanksgiving. As soon as we get past the harvest of uh, Halloween um, or our harvest festival where we give out tons of candy, we will uh, have uh, Thanksgiving. And God wanted them to have Thanksgiving, if you will, during the Feast of Tabernacles, to remember what he'd done for them and to eat their meal in his presence. Remember how we talked about Shiloh? How the people would all sit on the hillsides around, look in at the goings-on around the tabernacle, and eat their uh, meals in the presence of God, and, and remember what he had done for them. Well, one of the features of the Feast of Tabernacles really is built around this idea of the pillar of fire or the light that God gave. Uh, that light, a pillar of fire at night, a uh, pillar of cloud by day, would lead them. So whenever the, the cloud lifted and moved, they were to follow along. It protect, protected them against the Egyptians. And so in the Feast of Tabernacles, remembering the time in the wilderness, uh, light came to have a very uh, important feature to it. In fact, uh, there are, besides the booth in the Feast of Tabernacles, there were two ideas that came to have considerable play in the Feast of Tabernacles, this eight-day event every fall that every Jewish person was to observe. And those two elements were fire and water. 
You can see where the fire might come from, thinking about the wilderness, but we'll come to the water in just a little bit. But the fire had to do uh, with 1 Kings chapter 8, when Solomon dedicated the temple that he built. That temple was dedicated during the Feast of Tabernacles. So Solomon uh, moves the Ark of the Covenant from Mount Zion, where it had been housed, uh, to uh, Mount Moriah, or the Temple Mount there, and he put it in the temple. And in verse 10 of 1 Kings 8, it says this, When the priests withdrew from the holy place, the cloud filled the temple of the Lord, and the priests could not perform their service because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord filled the temple. So this cloud came into this temple that uh, Solomon had built. A and what a spectacular temple it was. We've talked about the cherubim that were on the walls and over the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, the cherubim being this uh, combined creature um, of an ox, a man, an eagle, and a lion. Uh, we, we call them sphinxes most commonly in the modern era, or griffins, but they're the cherubim really of the Bible. And they were all over in Solomon's temple by God's design. Uh, there was this really cool laver uh, with the oxen underneath. I had different projects that I wanted to do that I never quite got done. And one of them was to turn the baptistry into the laver of the, or the, uh, the, the brass and brazen sea and have oxen protruding out from the uh, uh, from that. I just never found the right artist uh, or had excess money to do it. But, you know, Solomon could do it. I don't see why Cedar Park couldn't. But anyway, it was one of my dreams that has yet to be achieved. Who knows? Maybe still there'll be opportunity. These are just various illustrations of the, um, the Temple of Solomon. But the point for our purposes here when Solomon dedicated his temple on the Feast of Tabernacles, God gave to the temple what he gave to the tabernacle in the wilderness. That is, he came down and inhabited that place and filled it. The priests exit, the presence of God comes in uh, and fills the te temple, the Shekinah glory of God, which was a sign of God's presence. So this was uh, an important event, not only the tabernacle in the wilderness, but the, the temple of Solomon and God's presence there. And this idea of light or fire is always used to represent is often used to represent the presence of God. So tonight, for example, uh, I lit the candles, uh, particularly to illustrate this point, because sometimes people wonder, why do you have candles uh, in a church? But the candles always represent the presence of God. If you come out of the high church traditions, like Catholic or Anglican or such like that, in those traditions, if the candles are burning, it means that the elements of the Eucharist are present. That is, uh, the elements of Holy Communion. And so, for example, you know, in, in Kirkland, there's St. John's uh, Episcopal Church. And uh, is it St. John's? Is that the name of it? I forget. But anyway... Uh, you go in there and on the wall, on the, you know, next to the, you know, off to the side, like over there, there's a candle. And if it's burning, it's actually a bowl. If it's burning, it means the elements of the Eucharist are present. For many, many years, actually from about 1985 until the present time, on Saturday nights when I pray, I always light the incense and I light a candle. I've done that almost every Saturday night since 1985. And um, we did it, I did it here last Saturday night in the sanctuary here. I got here ahead of everybody else about an hour earlier. So I lit the candles and lit the incense and then I start to pray. And, um, and I've done that 
for many, many decades. But the candle represents the presence of God. And um, for many years, by the way, here in the sanctuary, I had a candle on the altar that I tried to keep going 24 hours a day, uh, just permanently. And, uh, and it kept getting blown out. And it was starting to annoy me. And uh, that who is blowing out my candle? And so one day I was up in the loft before the walls were built. And uh, I, I happened to look down in the sanctuary. And my dear old father, who worked with me for 20 plus years, who was a preacher and a man of God and, and all of that, I see him come pattering across the front, stops at the altar, blows out the candle, and, and walks on. Uh, he was a practical person, but then when I realized it was my father, I didn't have any more angst on the subject. Uh, but anyway, it, it is designed to represent uh, the presence of God. That's why things like that are done. Well, the prophet Zechariah, in the last chapter of his prophecies and all, speaks about the day when God, when Jesus, will be again the light of the world. And we'll read, if we get to it at the end, we'll read all of Zechariah 14. But he said, on that day, there will be no light, no cold or frost. It will be a unique day without daytime or nighttime, a day known to the Lord. When evening comes, there will be light. And why will there be light without the need of daytime and nighttime? Because God is present and he is the light that lights the world. Jesus said, and we'll, I think we'll come to it a bit later, he said, uh, while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. One of my good friends, he's been dead for over 20 years now, but was Mark Buntain. He was probably the greatest missionary of the 20th century in, uh, and did incredible work in Calcutta, India. But one of the dreams he had uh, was to, I mean, he built great schools, you know, thousands and thousands of kids go to school out there every day, hospital, clinics, schools, hundreds of churches, all kinds of things. But he said he wanted to put into downtown uh, Calcutta on the highest point of the property there, uh, which would have been a 10-story building, which was built there. Uh, he said, I wanted to put up there in, in big neon lights, Jesus, light of the world. And I thought it was such a noble dream uh, because it is what we declare that Jesus is the light of the world. It reminded me of that guy in, was it in Karachi, Pakistan, that the guy told about on Sunday, the McDonald, John McDonald, who wants to build like a 150 foot cross and is building it in, in that city in Pakistan. That's awesome. Uh, that's an awesome idea. But this is the idea that we're looking forward to. Well, when we talk about the tabernacle and on into Solomon's temple and then on into the temple that Herod built, which they call the second temple, which is, I think, more properly the third temple, uh, light was very much a feature of that. Um, and there were in, uh, in these temples, uh, these candelabra that were in the temple mount, in the court of the women, in the um, temple of Herod that he built. Uh, and there's a description of it uh, in the Mishnah, uh, in Sukha, uh, the tractate Sukha 5.3 that uh, there were four of them, which this picture would illustrate, and they were 80 feet tall. And on the top of each of these pillars was a, a large bowl. And uh, another, uh, this particular illustration, it's a model that actually overlooks Temple Mount in the Jewish quarter on top of one of the buildings there. This is a model. Uh, but you, there are those you see... Um, those four candelabra, each one with four bowls on top. There are these ladders leaning up against it. And the young men, you don't want old men climbing up that high. They'd lose their balance and fall off, especially because they're hauling up big jugs of oil 
to uh, climb these ladders and dump these huge jugs of oil into these bowls on top. And then the leftover uh, clothing of the priests, which would be linen clothing, which is what they wore, uh, they would take their pants and stuff like that, and they would dump them into the uh, bowls on top. And so what you essentially have is a huge linen wick uh, burning this oil, uh, and it would create a huge flame. And so you'd have 16 uh, of these flames burning uh, in the uh, court of the women there. And in the, the Mishnah and places like that, it, it says that it would light every uh, household in Jerusalem. And Alfred Edersheim, in his book on the temple, says that you could read a book from the light of these candelabras on top of the Mount of Olives, which I would say as the crow flies is easily, you know, a more than a quarter of a mile. You know, it's not a half a mile, but it may be three eighths of a mile uh, to the top of the Mount of Olives from Temple Mount. I mean, it's some distance. And so to, it's such incredible light. But you can see that if the Feast of Tabernacles has as one of its features, remembering that God was with Israel in the wilderness with the pillar of light, and that when Solomon dedicated his temple, God came and inhabited it with his glory, the Shekinah glory of God, was this cloud that filled the temple, that, that in the Feast of Tabernacles, as they are remembering all of these things, it's entirely appropriate to light these giant 80-foot candles on fire and to light up everything. It would just help people to visualize what it is that God had done. And, uh, and Jesus, of course, the light of the world, which he describes himself as the light of the world in the Feast of Tabernacles. That's where that took place, his description of himself in that way. Well, so there is this uh, theme then of light that's very important to the Feast of Tabernacles. Now, the second feature of the Feast of Tabernacles has to do with water. And there's a particular reason for that. Uh, when Solomon dedicated the temple, uh, he, in his dedicatory uh, prayer and speech or whatever it was, more like a prayer, he said, when the heavens are shut up, and there is no rain because your people have sinned against you. And when they pray toward this place and confess your name and turn from their sin because you have afflicted them, then hear from heaven and forgive the sin of your servants, your people Israel. Teach them the right way to live and send rain on the land you gave your people for an inheritance." So this is part of the prayer of Solomon. He prays for the foreigner who's going to come and pray toward that place because of your name. Uh, he prays that their prayers will be heard, which is why always when we go, we go to the, one of the walls of Jerusalem, the western wall, and go to you know, that western wall closest to where the temple was, and we say a prayer. Sometimes you even put the prayer in writing and stick it in the cracks of the wall there because Solomon prayed, when the foreigners come because of your name, hear their prayer. But here, he said, when there is no rain because of a lack of, when there is no uh, yeah, rain because of the sin of the people and they confess their sins, then forgive them and send rain. You know, rain is important at two times of the year, particularly important in Israel. In the fall, when they plant the winter wheat. And in the springtime, uh, just before harvest. Right uh, now, we're not quite, well, we're getting close to where it's going to start raining in Israel. I've learned not to be in Israel past the 15th of November. And I don't like to be there past the 1st of November 
because I did once because you can get slightly cheaper rates, but you pay for it in the weather uh, because uh, the rain start. But you want that rain in the fall, that's called the former rain because you need the moisture to make the seeds germinate because it's bone dry at this moment in time in Israel. Bone dry because they probably haven't had any rain since April or if they have had, it's been very, very little. So then you plant, you plant your wheat, the rain comes, uh, the seeds sprout, and they grow through the winter, and everything turns green in, in Israel. The mountains, the hills turn green, beautiful. These anemones and different kinds of flowers begin to bloom, it's just gorgeous. Uh, green fields, lots of flowers, this kind of thing. In the desert, the desert literally blooms uh, in the winter. And then come spring, you want the latter rain to come because that bit of lane, rain causes the heads of the grain to fill up. If you don't get that spring rain, then your seeds or your wheat doesn't really develop. And so a lack of rain is seen in the, that kind of land as the judgment of God for the sins of the people. And so Solomon said, God, when we confess our sins, then uh, send rain uh, and teach us the way to live and send rain on the land to give your people uh, for an inheritance. So this rain is important to the prosperity of Jerusalem and of Israel. Well, this prayer, Solomon prays at the Feast of Tabernacles, at the time of dedication. And so you have the, the fire and light theme and you have the water theme. That is very important to it. And when the day of the Lord comes, um, Zechariah said, on that day, living water will flow out from Jerusalem. So the coming of the Lord to Jerusalem will be the introduction of living water that will flow out to the whole earth. And if you go out to the chapel of the resurrection, look at that giant stained glass window that's out there. It has the eastern gate of Jerusalem, the eastern wall of Jerusalem. And then you can see that the river is uh, shown there flowing out from the throne of God. Now in a few minutes, we're gonna talk about the only natural source of water that there is in Jerusalem. Well, Jesus brought these two elements of light or fire and water together to describe himself at the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And I'd like to uh, give you a little bit about that. Uh, I'm going to uh, show you come some of the physical aspects. This is actually a diagram of, you see down there in the lower corner is Gihon Springs. That's the only natural water source for Jerusalem. Uh, today, the water comes in mostly from Galilee. It's piped in, of course, but this was the original water source. Uh, you have the, the little horizontal Hezekiah's Tunnel, 1,750 feet long plus. Then you see the label there called Warren Shaft, and you have this shaft that goes up inside the old city walls. When it was a Jebusite city and King David was attacking uh, the city of Jerusalem, his general got into the city by going in through the spring, going to that shaft and waiting for the gushing of the water because it wasn't a continuous flowing spring it was a periodically flowing spring. In other words, it gushed, kind of like Old Faithful or something like that. Uh, it didn't flow evenly. And even a few years ago when they first discovered all of this, uh, it still flowed intermittently. And so you didn't want to be in the tunnel when it started gushing. I mean, when I first started walking through Hezekiah's tunnel, it would be in water up to my waist. 
but, but evenly. They evened it out, so it flowed evenly. Today, they've shrunk that, and so you walk through in six inches of water. You know, so you get your shoes wet, but nothing else. But it feels a little safer for people, you know, because the ceiling gets a little low at places, you know, and you don't want to be hunched over with the water coming up on you. And, you know, claustrophobic people don't do that well. So they've made it a lot better now, and it's all good. But uh, you go down into, when you go into this area that we're describing there, uh, you go into these, uh, down these long sets of stairs, you can see the person down there at the bottom uh, going through these shafts and such. They've kind of changed it from, you know, when I first started going, uh, you uh, actually entered into Gihon Spring. You would, you'd go around the outside through the valley and you'd come to Gihon Spring and there was uh, an Arab guy that actually had a shop up above... Um, the spring, that's where I bought my first uh, ancient lamp from him. He lived in Silwan. But uh, then there was a gate there. He was the keeper of the gate. Uh, I know that because one time I came in from the backwards, came in from the Pool of Siloam, walked backwards through the tunnel, and when I got there, the gate was locked. Uh, and so this was a problem. But anyway, you walk down these set of stairs and um, kind of into this hole, and uh, this is now looking at it from the inside, looking up those set of stairs. You see the water. The water kind of gushed out from the bottom down there and into a small little pool there. And this was all part and parcel of Gihon Spring as it has existed for a very long time. Um, and in, in the old days, you know, we're talking before, let's say, 2,700 years ago, before the year 700 BC, uh, they went to the outside. But when Sennacherib, the Assyrian, was coming against Israel, uh, they realized they, one of the ways to prevent him from harming Jerusalem was they completely blocked up Gihon Spring. Uh, and what they did is they dug a tunnel through the solid rock for 1,700, over 1,750 feet, and had the water flow through that tunnel into the pool of Siloam, which was inside the city walls. And then they cover over from the outside Gihon Spring and threw trash over it, so when the invading army wouldn't realize that that's where the wa water source was outside the walls. When you go to Megiddo, you can see exactly the same thing where they did it in the defense of Megiddo. So they carved this long um, channel through the rock. This shows it how it is. Uh, these days, it, it, you know, maybe 15 years ago or so, they actually put concrete down on the bottom, so it's all smooth now. But when I first started walking through Hezekiah's tunnel, it would, the rocks were still natural and you could trip and that sort of thing. So they've all smoothed it out now and the water is nice and level. So there I am taking, that's a picture of my shoes. You can see that it barely covers my tennis shoes now. So it's not freaky deaky like it used to be. Uh, but in places, you know, it gets a little bit small uh, like this narrow. So you got to bend down. I think that's David Fend if I recognize the backside of him correctly. Um, and, you know, in other places it gets to be uh, higher uh, because, um, well, that's just the way it is. They didn't quite have the levels set because they worked at it from both ends. They were in a big hurry. You know, the Assyrians are coming. Let's get this thing dug. And so they got guys working at it from both ends. You know, they pound away at the rocks, see if they can hear the other guys at the other end, and they follow their ears. And so, which is why it has a bit of a serpentine look. And when they get really close, it really zigzags. Um, but anyway, you walk through this tunnel, Hezekiah's tunnel, and you come to the end, and it, it comes out into this little pool, which for many years was known as the Pool of Siloam. But in the very recent excavations, they think that this was actually a little different pool, a Byzantine pool, and you got to go another 
you know, 50 feet before, or 75 feet before you actually get to the pool of Siloam. That's Jazzy there on my left. She was home, homecoming queen for Cedar Park Christian School this year. And there's Grant on the other side of me, Grant Gortz, and he was homecoming sage for uh, Cedar Park Christian School uh, this last weekend. And the guy in the striped shirt, of course, is yours truly. And it comes out into this little uh, pool like this. Well, this is um, uh, Gihon Spring, the place where Solomon was crowned king. Uh, with, and they heard the sounding of the trumpets. David ordered that, you know, they should blow the trumpet and shout, the new, there's a new king in town. And, and he said, yep, there he is right down there. He was kind of heading off a rebellion and announced that that was Solomon that was down there. Well, uh, this play, this tunnel and all of this uh, flows out into the pool of Siloam. And now I'd like to describe for you how Jesus uh, fulfills the water part of the ceremony. And, uh, and we'll, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, in the ceremony on the last day, of the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, what they would do is the, the priests, you know, with great fanfare, the blowing of the silver trumpets, there would be this big march, this big ceremony with lots of instruments and, and a big to-do. They would go down to the pool of Siloam with a golden pitcher and they would dip it into the pool of Siloam. So, uh, the pool of Siloam, as the scripture tells us, means the pool of him who was sent, which is wonderful when you think about another story of Jesus. But anyway, they go down there and they dip this uh, golden pitcher of water. And there you can see the priest is carrying that pitcher up uh, into the temple area uh, amidst this fanfare of the trumpets and all of that. They would take these, this pitcher uh, as well as a pitcher uh, of uh, wine, another similar pitcher of wine, and they would go up into the temple uh, mount. This picture shows you where the arrow is, the pool of Siloam uh, in the time of Jesus. So there'd be this march from there. This is from the model that's at the uh, Israeli Museum. It's a huge, huge model, covers, you know, that'd be, that's a big model. That's, a, that's a, a fence rail that you see along the side, so that gives you some idea. You, they would walk up uh, across the gates, into up those gates, and into the Temple Mount. Uh, the priests would mount up to the uh, altar, and at the altar, there would be two funnels, and simultaneously... Um, so they would gather there, one priest with the water from the pool of Siloam, one priest with the wine, and they would, and simultaneously, each one would pour the water into the funnel, and it would flow down to the base of the altar. Now just think about that for a moment. That is exactly what happened when Jesus was crucified. Because the, his own blood was flowing down the cross and pooling at the bottom of the cross. And when the soldier pierced his side, it says, uh, blood and water ran out. Well, you know what happened. The, uh, the spear would have pierced the pericardial sac around the heart. Uh, and it would have been filled with fluid that would be like water. And that Water from around the, in the pericardial sac would have flowed out of his wounds and would have flowed down the cross and would have gathered at the base of the altar, if you will, meaning the cross. That was exactly what happened when the priest, and they had no idea how it would lead to Christ, but when the priests would pour the water and the wine and they would mix together at the base of the altar. Well, that, at that moment... There's a huge crowd on Temple Mount, easily 100,000 people. Okay, Temple Mount is 40 acres. This property 
is 46 acres. Cedar Park's property on this campus is 46 acres. So when you think about all the way down to the apartments, all the way down to the crest of the hill, you know, the fields, the church, the parking lots, all of that, that's about the size of Temple Mount. And if everybody's standing, it wouldn't be hard to put 100,000 people on Temple Mount. You, you might, you, you could maybe put a quarter of a million people there standing. It's because this is the big deal. This is the big deal of eight of the eighth day. So they're all gathered there and they've been all this blowing of trumpets and the march of the priests up to the temple and, and they pour out the altar on the altar. And when that happens, kind of the word goes out and everybody inside the temple grounds out around Temple Mount, the court of the women, the court of the Gentiles, everybody is supposed to fall silent in that moment, and they are to pray. And the prayer that they're supposed to pray are the words of Isaiah 44, 3. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour out my spirit on your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. They will spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees by flowing streams. Well, do you see how that prayer fits in with the Feast of Tabernacles? How it fits in with Solomon's dedicatory prayer? That when you pray, uh, pray God will forgive our sins, pray that the rain will come, and that we will be blessed, we'll have our inheritance, we'll have the results. Well, so here in Isaiah 44, they take that prayer that Isaiah 44 has and they make that a feature, a regular feature of the Feast of Tabernacles because it's water on the thirsty land, it's streams on the dry ground, but that is paralleled. Water and streams has as its parallel my spirit on your offspring. God's spirit on your family is comparable to water on the ground in a desert. That is, it makes things, makes things flourish. So your spirit on your offspring and blessing on your descendants. You know, I showed you those two kids a moment ago. Those are two of my 11 grandchildren. And I was proud to tell you the honors that their peers had bestowed upon them. Well, when I look upon that, uh, that blesses me. I was in the second grade classroom today. In one of the classrooms, I have my uh, uh, grandson, my youngest grandson in the school. I have one younger than him, uh, Jacob Feeton. He's in that classroom. And so uh, they were at, the class was asking me questions about how we started the school and all of these kinds of things and how I came to do that and about my life and things. And, uh, you know, it's such a blessing to me to be able to see my uh, little second grade grandson there. And, uh, and all of my grandkids have been in the school. One's out now and one's yet to arrive. But they've all been in the school. And it's such a blessing. You know, you want to see your kids doing well. And your grandkids doing well. And so it is a blessing uh, to us. And that's the nature of the prayer that people prayed on the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. Except they couched it in the language of water in the desert, streams in the desert, and my spirit, uh, God's spirit, upon uh, my children and my descendants. Spring up like grass in a meadow, like poplar trees on flowing streams. So this is prayed in silence, not like in a Pentecostal church, but it's prayed like in a Presbyterian church, in silence. Uh, everybody prays, but they pray the same prayer. Okay, Jesus wasn't so politically or spiritually correct in that moment because at the very moment that everybody is praying that prayer in silence, Jesus gets up and booms out in a big voice. And you know, all of this Temple Mount is stone and it's got stone walls on the side. Uh, the colonnades are stone. So you, your sound is going to boom out there. And so Jesus booms out 
And what he says in a loud voice, if anyone is thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, streams of living water will flow from within him. By this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. Up to that time, the Spirit had not been given since Jesus had not yet been glorified. Do you see how Jesus showed himself to be the fulfillment of the prayers of the people for blessing on their kids? He said, if you're thirsty, if you are that dry land that wants blessing upon your family and upon your kids, then I'm the one. Come to me and drink. If you drink from me, then out of your innermost being, a, a river of living water is going to flow. Living water is flowing water, not stagnant water. It's life-giving water. And lest anyone be mistaken about that, John very clearly tells us the meaning of it. He said, by this he meant the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were later to receive. So the rivers of living water, what is that? John tells us that's the Spirit. They're going to receive the Spirit later, which of course they do uh, uh, in, you know, on, in John 20, with the inbreathed Spirit and the outpoured Spirit of Acts chapter 2. Well, this is a big moment. This is a big moment in Jewish history because Jesus shows himself to be the answer to the prayers of the Jewish people for blessing on their children. Now, Zechariah 14 is going to show us more about the Feast of Tabernacles and its final fulfillment in days that are yet to come when God once again tabernacles with his people as he did in the wilderness tabernacle, as he did in Solomon's temple when he came and inhabited the temple and filled it with his glory, but he's going to show himself to be that one. And just to show you a few more pictures here, uh, there is Siloam, shows the colonnade. Uh, this picture is from 1895. What you see there is that little, little first pool that I showed you about, which they now believe is actually part of a Byzantine pool, but it was what is known as the Pool of Siloam for many, many decades. And here's a, a painting, uh, or I guess that's a photograph actually from um, um, the late 1800s. I have some pictures from that time period in some books that I have. Now here is the Pool of Siloam as it uh, actually is today. This has been most recently excavated, I'm thinking maybe eight years ago now. Uh, the black line that you see running through there, well I think this labeling here will show you that. Uh, that's the sewer line that they were putting in because, um, and that's what caused them to discover all this that was down below. Uh, the pool of Siloam, what it points to there, are actually the steps. And over on the right, uh, the far right, it says soil still covers the unexcavated part of the pool. But uh, this is where the water from Gihon Spring flows. Uh, looking at it from the other direction, the steps go down into the pool, so the pool is actually here on the left. And uh, this next picture actually shows it uh, after a rain uh, in the uh, fall. Uh, after a particularly heavy rain, the water overflows and flows down into that little pool there. And the water that you see on the left is the outermost edge of what is uh, presently excavated. You can see there where there is no water in it in the present uh, where the pool is. So there's more that can be excavated. There's a farmer that owns a field there uh, who's elderly and maybe when he dies, they'll get the ability to go a little farther with that. Uh, there are groups that own peace, own property and individuals above this city of David that, and some of them are Muslim who refuse to sell. And so the Israelis can't excavate uh, more down there, but they have been able to uh, go this far. And now when you go through this part of the 
city of David, you come out in this location and then walk a little further and catch the bus back up into the city. Um, just, uh, it doesn't so much relate to this, but it does relate to the water gate. Uh, and that is, uh, I'd like to go back to uh, Nehemiah. Nehemiah, you know, comes back after the Babylonian captivity and rebuilds the city, uh, the walls and such like that. And there's a significant moment, and it's a time of revival, of restoration in Israel. But Nehemiah 7, let me just read that narrative. When the seventh month came and the Israelites had settled in their towns, all the people assembled as one man in the square before the water gate. They told Ezra, the scribe, to bring out the book of the law of Moses, which the Lord had commanded for Israel. So on the first day of the seventh month, Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which was made up of men and women and all who were able to understand. He read it aloud from daybreak till noon as he faced the square before the water gate in the presence of the men, women, and others who could understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Uh, and of course, the water gate gets its name from the ceremony that I've just been describing. Because the priests come from Siloam, go up through the water gate, uh, and the temple at this time, during this particular period, is known as the house of outpouring. So it tells you how important the water feature uh, was as a part of it. Um, let me, um, so does anybody want to ask a question before I go on to kind of the gates and the walls and just kind of thinking about the time here? Anybody, uh, yes, you want to, Chris, you want to take a microphone back there? Go, go ahead and ask it again so everybody can hear. Okay. So this is the lower pool where Jesus healed a paralytic that had been laying for 30 years? Uh, no, that's the pool of Bethesda, and that's right inside the sheep gate. I'll show you that since you asked about where that was. But the, the man that Jesus healed here, do you remember the story where the disciples, they see this blind guy, and they say, who sinned, this man or his father, that this man was born blind? And Jesus said, well, neither one. Uh, this happened so that God's glory could be shown. And so he spits on the ground, takes a little bit of mud from it, rubs it in the man's eyes, and he says, now go down to the pool of Siloam and wash. And when he went down there and washed, he came back seeing. And of course, that was a, not only a miracle, but having it take place in the pool of Siloam, the pool of him who was sent. Healing the eyes of the blind, as well as the lame, was a sign of the Messiah. And so to have the Messiah heal a man in the pool of him who was sent equates to Jesus being the fulfillment of the prophecies that the Messiah would open the eyes of the blind. Thanks. I'll show you though when we, where the pool of Bethesda is when we come to the gates in a little bit. Anybody else have a question on what we've covered so far? Do they have any sense of how big that pool is? Um, I don't know the dimensions of it. Uh, I mean this this distance that's been unearthed, and it goes back a little farther. Some of you that have been there with me estimate that. Would it be, and the corner is right here. So I'm guessing that's about 80 feet um, uh, from this corner, which you see right down here in front. The, the part where the rocks are in the back, that's, there's more pool going that way. But uh, so they don't, I don't think they know how far back it actually goes. But I would guess it's probably about, you know, 50 by 80 or some, some dimension like that. And not super deep. You can see about how deep it is, but not super deep. I'm going to dig a pool about that size in my uh, field one of these days. Yes, sir. Yeah. What was the... Uh a book and chapter for these uh, 38, 38. Where, where is that? Uh, that's John 7, 35 to 37, I believe, somewhere in those verses. I Didn't I put the verses there? Yeah, that's, so that begins in verse 37 of John 7, sorry. 
Anybody else with a question? Okay, let's just do a little kind of a fun tour of uh, the gates and walls of Jerusalem. So in Nehemiah's day, there were various um, gates and walls. So they restore the wall. Um, we identify there the Pool of Siloam. We identify in the square Gihon Spring. You see the meandering tunnel, the 1,750-foot tunnel that takes us down to the Pool of Siloam. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk with you around, uh, well, you know, some of these, the gates that we're going to see today are not precisely the same as these gates. But there's the water gate. You see it's closest to um, Gihon Spring. And that horse gate, eh, yeah, they, I, you can't make the full connection with the gates of today. But let me um, take you to uh, the city walls of Jerusalem. The old city of Jerusalem is surrounded by walls. These walls were built by Suleiman the Magnificent. He was a bit like Donald Trump in that he, uh, Trump would call himself Trump the Magnificent, but Suleiman called himself the Magnificent because of the things that he did. Uh, and, um, and these walls were among them in the year 15, 16, uh, over those next few years there. And so that's when these particular walls were built. But they surround all of the old city. This is actually the eastern gate. So this is the wall that faces the, val uh, the Kidron Valley and the Garden of Gethsemane and all of that. But these walls go all the way around. Uh, they're in pretty good condition for, having, for being as old as they are. And they make it quite a cool place. That's the tower you see there is called the Citadel of David, though no actual connection to David. But um, these walls are tall, they're strong, they're um, cool, they're impressive. That's an olive tree that you see growing there in front of it. But these are just some of the walls that as they uh, currently exist, this kind of faces out toward the main city of Jerusalem as it is today. Those are the southern wall. That's the southern wall of Jerusalem. The two people you see walking along the base there are Jay and Sandy. They're going down to check out some of the things. Look at the size of the stones next to them. You see those stones just to Jay's left there? Those stones are taller than he is. Um, those are some big stones. And then the one right up here front left, you can see that's one stone from ground level up to where those smaller stones start to come into play. But it's big. Uh, by the way, Suleiman builds these. And uh, a few years ago, I was into collecting coins. I, mean, I still am, but I'm not buying any of these days. But back in the day, I found that I could buy Islamic coins on eBay at a very cheap price because the Islamic types hadn't really figured it out yet. And so I actually picked up a coin, a gold coin of Suleiman the Magnificent, uh, one of his coins, and I paid only the spot price of gold. So I got a coin of the guy who built the walls of Jerusalem as though it were just raw gold, which I consider to be a particular uh, trophy, uh, which I still have, and one of these days when I need the money, I'm going to sell it. But, uh, but anyway, so I'll take you through the gates uh, as they exist today. Uh, this is called uh, the New Gate. It was built uh, new because it was built in 1889. What year did Washington become a state? Hello? 1889. So the year Washington became a state, uh, they built this. It was, uh, this goes into the Christian quarter and uh, it gave access to the communities uh, that were developing outside of the ancient city. You know, Jerusalem didn't used to have a lot of people in it. Of course, it's grown dramatically in the last 120 years. But uh, so when they begin to spill outside the walls, this took you outside the Christian quarter and into the new, um, new communities on the outside. Uh, this gate is the Damascus gate. It's probably the most ornate of those just by the decoration there. And um, 
This is an older uh, picture of it, a drawing, and this is a picture that I took, a, I think I took that one, a few years ago, um, quite a few years ago actually. But uh, the Damascus Gate is named for kind of where the road leads. So you have a couple of these that are named according to where they go. So the Damascus, if you want to go from Jerusalem to Damascus, you head out this gate. When I wanted to go up to uh, the West Bank, like to Jifna, and you know, if you're going to places up north where, uh, that's like Shiloh, and you want to go by taxi, you'd go out to the Damascus Gate, because there you could find an Arab taxi. And, uh, and you get your taxi there, and that's because that's where I went to get my taxi up to uh, Jifna. But anyway, that's the Damascus Gate. And it's a little different than that now, actually. Uh, and this is uh, Herod's Gate. It connects to the Muslim Quarter. And right outside of this gate is where the old dividing line was when it was divided between East and West uh, Jerusalem in the Jordanian years. So the Jordanian side was uh, to the east and the Jewish side was to the west and the dividing line was right in that area of Herod's Gate. But these um, show it this way, uh, sometimes called the Flower Gate because of that little rosette that's up in that circle above the gate and above like that. Um, that's another of the same. And then when you, that's going on the, um, what would that be, the north side of the, <clears throat> of the, of the city. Uh, this is the general area where pretty much everybody that broke into Jerusalem, did. it's like the Crusaders came over the wall uh, in this area. That's where they made the breach and came into the city of uh, Jerusalem. It's where Titus, when he conquered Jerusalem, he had stayed the night actually in Jephna, the place where I just told you about. It's where Musa Abed lives. He's a, was, he used to be a member of our church. And, uh, but anyway, um, and they come over the north wall. And so that's the weakest part of the city. And it's the one where the hills are closest to the wall and such like that. So that's the uh, north side. Then you go around to the east side of the gate. Uh, and you come to the Lion's Gate or St. Stephen's Gate. Uh, the Crusaders call it Josephat's Gate. Because going down from um, on the east side, you come to the Valley of Jehoshaphat, uh, the place where the judgment takes place at the end time um, in many traditions. But it's called the Lion's Gate. You can see there's a couple of um, animals that look somewhat like lions there. This is my daughter, Razi, when she was about 16. That's why the color is kind of weird there, um, because Razi is close to 40 now. So that was taken a long time ago. Here is a, a later picture that I took. That's the Shirley family down there in the lower right, Jason and Marlene. Jason's the treasurer of our church. And there are their two kids that they had at that time. But this gate, the Lion's Gate or St. Stephen's Gate, why do you think it would be called St. Stephen's Gate? Because this is where St. Stephen was stoned. You know, they take him, it's right near Temple Mount. Uh, they take him um, right outside this gate, and this is where he's stoned. Where Saul sees it all happen, it happens right outside of here. Now, you asked about the pool of Bethesda. When you go through these gates and go up there, you know, less than 100 yards, to the right is the Church of St. Anne. It's uh, the kind of the coolest crusader church because uh, it's all stone. Everybody that goes in there sings. I have a great picture of you uh, sitting outside of that little church there, sitting down there by the pool of Bethesda. Um, but um, that's St. Anne's Church. And you go in there and you sing as it all echoes. And, you know, the reverb is like three or four seconds. So it's a cool place to sing a really slow song. Not any we would sing today. But, uh, and then the pool of Bethesda is right to the right there. Uh, that was where uh, Jesus healed the man who had been sick for 38 years. And this is just another uh, picture of that same gate. So that is uh, kind of just around the corner from the north uh, on the eastern side. You go further down the wall and you come to one of the more famous gates. 
and uh, that is the eastern gate, which is over to the right in this picture. But this is the eastern wall that faces east, we should say. Of course, the Dome of the Rock is a very recognized um, landmark. And behind is the city of Jerusalem. The two gray domes just to the right of the Golden Dome, one the slightly smaller, darker one in the front, that's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, where the crucifixion took place, where the resurrection took place inside of that large, large building there. Uh, one day I climbed that big tall tower that you see over there. That's a church. I think it's a Lutheran kind of a church. But I climbed up into the bell tower there, and I had a shofar with me. And uh, I let loose with a few blasts, blasting out over all of Jerusalem there on the shofar. But anyway, that's the eastern wall and the eastern gate now blocked off. This is a little closer view of that. There is a Muslim cemetery in front of the eastern gate put there because the word was out of um, chapter 44 of, um, I forget the book now, but um, anyway, where it talks about the prince going through this gate. The belief was that when Messiah returns, because Zechariah says he'll come to the Mount of Olives, and the mountain will split in two, and he will essentially enter into his uh, rule, and that he will pass through the eastern gate. And this belief was that this was Jesus. That would, and he, in fact, that's the correct belief. And so, of course, the Muslims hear this, and they say, you know, we are not going to have the Jewish Messiah coming into our town and trying to take over, so we are going to solve that problem. We're going to solve it in two ways. We're going to block it up, because you can't get through that. And, uh, and we're going to put a cemetery here because no self-respecting Jewish person is going to walk through a Muslim cemetery. And uh, so I don't know what Jesus is going to do when he comes. How is he going to get through this gate? It's blocked up. Seems impossible to me. You know, when you've just split the Mount of Olives in two, it doesn't strike me that it's going to be that difficult to get through that gate. Uh, but anyway, that's the uh, eastern gate, and it's a very famous gate. Um, I thought I had a picture from the inside, but you can go from the other side and look in. I've never been down to the surface there, but someday maybe I'll get there. A few years ago, they were mucking around. Somebody was there, and there had been a particular heavy rain. And just to the left of that, uh, right off the left column there of that gate, it had caved in. And they went down in there, and what they found were the actual arches from the gate that went back to Roman days. So it tells you that the Roman Eastern Gate is virtually identical with this Suleiman Eastern Gate that's been there since the early 1500s. So you go, now we're, we're kind of walking down. We've been to uh, St. Stephen's Gate, and now we've come to the Eastern Gate, and it takes you on around to the temple, uh, mount to the southern wall, and the next gate that you come to is called the Dung Gate. Uh, it's where in ancient times from this area, uh, the refuse from the animals and, and all of that was hauled out to, be, uh, to the garbage, essentially. Well, this has been changed, it's been modified in a few years back, and so this is now the entrance to uh, the Western Wall or to Temple Mount. In fact, if you look through that gate and you see that tower kind of on the right-hand side, that tower is on Temple Mount. So the Western Wall is right there. And so if you're going to go to the Western Wall today, if you don't come through the city, which uh, we try not to do to get to here, because you like to get here about 7 o'clock in the morning or 7.30 to beat the crowds, you want to be front first in line. Uh, so the bus drops you off here and you walk in um, past the Southern Wall uh, you know, exhibition and all, and you go on up to Western Wall. But that is the, uh, the access to the Temple Mount today. This is uh, another picture of that same gate. And now we um, go on, that was kind of on that 
um, corner almost, if you will, when things are starting to turn, and you go on up to the gate that's called the Zion Gate. This gate uh, leads you to the Jewish quarter. And so if you go through this gate and just keep, you know, kind of zigzags and keep on following it, there's some nice Armenian quarter is to the left there, like some cool shops and Armenian stuff and their cathedral. And then you go to the right and you go to the Jewish quarter. And this is basically the extension of the cardo. Cardo meaning heart, the heart of the city. So the old Roman cardo passes right through this zone here. And that's where I go and buy coins and stuff like that. There's a cool shop there that I know, a curmudgeon of a guy, grumpiest guy you'll ever meet. But he knows his stuff on coins. And so I always try to buy one coin from him if I can tolerate him for that long. Uh, but anyway, um, so this gate is Zion Gate because this is Mount Zion that it opens up to on your left here. Uh, and if you look a little closer at the, the gate, you'll notice that it's all pockmarked. Uh, those are from bullets. Because in the, 60, uh, in the 48 war, 1948, the War of Independence, there were some serious battles that took place at this entry point. Uh, and the Israelis made their way, but I mean, the whole thing was just blasted. But they've left it that way, which is kind of nice uh, to actually see. So this is the Zion Gate from Mount Zion uh, into the old city of Jerusalem. Zion, where David had his palace. And, and if you go out this way, you can keep on going down the hill and you get down to the Pool of Siloam and places like that. And uh, the last gate that exists today is the Jaffa Gate or the Joppa Gate. Um, Jaffa, Joppa, just different languages for the same place. And like the Damascus Gate, this is the road that you would take if you were going to go down to the city of Joppa. What Bible character is most closely connected to Joppa? Who can answer that question? There's no prize involved. But who can answer the question, what Bible character set sail from Joppa? Jonah, exactly. He was called to go to Nineveh, to Mosul, if you will. He says, I don't like those Iraqis. Or they weren't Iraqis then. I don't like those people up there at Mosul. They weren't called Mosul then. It was Nineveh. And so he says, I'm going the other way. And so instead of going to Mosul, he moseys over across the ocean. But God had a different plan, didn't he? And he was able to take him to a place that had an organ, a, a church that had an organ, it was a stomach, as it turned out, uh, and strained grass instead of stained glass, but it was the belly of a great fish. But anyway, that's Joppa. Uh, this gate is the Joppa Gate, and uh, it's a small gate, a pedestrian gate only, and um, uh, here would be another view of it. This is kind of a plaza uh, that opens out here, but uh, you can't see it in this picture, but this is kind of the pedestrian entrance. But around the corner of this is, there's a big opening. Uh, there's a breach in the wall. Uh, 1898, uh, German Emperor Wilhelm II wanted to enter the old city. And the lore was that the conqueror would enter on a white horse. He didn't want to dismount. And so, uh, according to the legend, I suppose, it's uh, probably, not, probably more than a legend, but... Um, it was kind of blasted open, and so he could ride through the wall on his uh, white stallion and be every inch the conqueror. But today, of course, it's where you go and buy some good orange juice inside. And when I go to get my uh, the stuff that I like to bring home, my uh, stuff that I use on my eggs and potatoes, my hyssop, I go in here and turn to the left and go buy a bunch down there, and, and uh, there's good herbs and such like that. But uh, so this would be the final gate of Jerusalem as we know it today. But just leave you kind of with one last picture, which I think is kind of a cool picture. I took this picture from Temple Mount, uh, fairly near the eastern gate, but looking over the wall that faces east uh, to this iconic image 
of this Orthodox Church with the golden domes with the cross over the top. When Jesus comes back, he's going to walk right near that space and uh, walk down that little hill through the, val through the val Kidron Valley, through the Garden of Gethsemane where he sweat the drops of blood, where he was taken captive uh, toward the cross, walk in victory across that little valley, up the rise, through the Eastern Great Gate, onto Temple Mount, and Isaiah, or not Isaiah, but uh, Zechariah chapter 14 will be fulfilled on that day, which is yet future, when once again, God will tabernacle with his people. This will take place one of these days in that exact spot. And to me, that's a cool picture of the wall, uh, the cross, and Temple Mount. Anybody have any questions over the walls, gates, or any related subject? Yeah, go ahead. Chris, need your microphone there for the sake of the people online if they've endured to this point. So when you're talking about the gates, I'd heard that the eye of the needle was a gate. Is that true? Um, it's often been said. I mean, you can trace that back for a hundred years, that expression. But um, there is no physical reality connected to that. The eye of a needle is the eye of a needle. It's not a gate. Um, I mean, there is no historic evidence for that phrase. I mean, I've heard it, as, as you have, and you can find it in lots of literature, lots of books have it, but only about the last hundred years or so. So I don't know who originated that idea that there is such a place, but it clearly was a person who hadn't been there. Uh, because there is no eye of a needle that I've ever been able to discover, and I've actually searched for that idea. Um, I don't believe that is a true characterization of a space. A camel can't pass through the eye of a needle like the needle that your mother had that she used to sew with. That's the needle that is talking about, in my opinion. Anybody else? You know, there are, there are similar things to that idea, uh, just to kind of speak on the other side of it. In Bethlehem, the entry to the church uh, is only about this tall, and that's a later development. And the reason they put that there was because people were riding their horses into the church. And so it made them get off their horse and bow down uh, before they walked into the church. So there is that kind of thing. That does exist there. But, um, but there, that's the closest you can come to uh, that idea that I know of uh, anywhere in the Holy Land. Anybody else with a question or a comment? So, Chris, what's on the docket for next week? So, next week, I'm going to be speaking. I uh, just went ahead and scheduled myself. I'm going to do a talk that's called The Heavens Declare the Glory of God. Be just good. kind of a tour of the cosmos, helping us develop a better appreciation of just how big our God really is. Awesome. It's pretty cool. And uh, what do you do for a living, Chris? I teach here at Cedar Park Christian Schools. What do you teach? Uh, high school life science, biology, chemistry, human anatomy and physiology, and creation apologetics. Very good. And um, what's your website, your primary website called? The, the main address is uh, the Nor a Northwest Creation Network, just at nwcreation.net. Yeah. I've really come to like Chris a lot, uh, which is why I wanted to do this series with him. Uh, he's the kind of person that I wish more people could hear and do hear. Of course, they are through your website and your teaching and now these Wednesday night apologetic kinds of things. But... Uh, Chris is a good guy. You need to get acquainted with him and uh, promote these Wednesday night uh, things that he's doing because he's filling a gap that needs to be filled in the knowledge base for Christians. So we get two weeks of apologetics, defense of the faith, defense of the scripture, particularly related to science, and then a couple of weeks related to Israel, related to Bible lands, and kind of the... Uh, touring, seeing the place. 
And uh, we're gearing up, by the way, just in case anybody has an interest. Uh, our next trip is going to be in June of 2017. So as soon as school is out, uh, in mid-June, I think it's like the 16th or something of June, we're going to Israel. And uh, we've got some great stuff planned there for Israel. Cool things you'll enjoy. And then the tag-on, we always do Israel plus a tag-on. And the tag-on for this year is Rome. So there's some wonderful things to see in Rome. We were supposed to be in Turkey right now, but the State Department doesn't think Turkey is a great place for Americans to be right now. And so we actually postponed that trip. And so we'll hopefully go to Turkey someday when things settle down, but not when they're busy blowing each other up over there. Israel is safe, in my opinion. I've never had any anxiety at any time uh, when I've been in Israel. Uh, but, uh, and so we're going to go and um, be there in the time past the latter rain. So it's, it's a summer trip. So we're going to float down the uh, Jordan River. We're going to snorkel in the Caesarea Harbor. Remember we talked about Caesarea? And uh, by the way, there's a great program on TV I saw the other day about Rome and the cement, how they made cement in Rome in ancient times. That's how Herod made his cement uh, for the harbor. Uh, unbelievable. Pouring cement underwater. Unbelievable. You can still see uh, the columns in the water and you can snorkel. There's a pathway that you can snorkel on. I've done that a couple of times. That's cool. Last time I went, the jellyfish were in, so we couldn't snorkel. But... Um, and uh, we will do some, we'll go to a Bedouin place and ride some camels and do some ridiculous things. And so float in the Dead Sea, baptize people in the Jordan River, in the place where Jesus was baptized, where the Jordan River isn't any wider than this section of, of uh, seats and where you see the Jordanian guard sitting as close as some of you are to me on the other side of the river. And you wade in and baptize people and praise the Lord and come back out. But anyway, great fun. And if you'd like to make a trip, and if you can't afford a trip this time, uh, during the millennium, I'm going to put into the Lord and see if I can give tours. And uh, although he might take the tours himself, uh, but if he's got room, I'm going to ask for opportunity to take tours. Uh, and everybody will have to go for the Feast of Tabernacles. That's what Zechariah says. If they don't go to the Feast of Tabernacles in Jerusalem, talk about the nations, they will have no rain. So God will force people to go to Jerusalem for the Feast of Tabernacles when he returns. Everybody has to go uh, or they'll have no rain, which around here we'd say, how long does that last? But, uh, but anyway, biblically speaking, you want the rain because it's the sign of God's blessing. Is the Northwest blessed or what? Indeed. Or what? All right. Let's stand together. Thanks for coming out tonight. Thanks to you who are watching by way of that awesome thing called the Internet. The greatest thing invented in my lifetime is the Internet. And I'm glad you're taking advantage of it. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do bless you today. I thank you for these students of the Word of God who have an eagerness for you and for the things of God. Bless them, I pray. Lord, we pray your blessing upon Cedar Park as we move into this uh, end of the year for our uh, church business meeting and all of that. Your blessing has been upon this church, and we thank you that your blessing is on it uh, today. Continue to prosper your people and strengthen us for the work you have for us to do. May your peace go with each one who's here tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God be with you.